See, now I don't consider myself a hero by any long stretch of the imagination. I was there uh, doing my job. The United States and their allies were undertaking a pretty big undertaking. very happy to introduce Mr. James Foster. James is from Coolamie, North Carolina, so welcome. Thank you. I'm going to slide that mic over uh, to you just a little bit there. Uh, Mr. Foster? Yes, sir. Tell us about, uh, in 1940, before the war began, what were you doing? In 1940, I was, I suppose I was working in the Irving Mills there in Coolamie. Making denim yeah like in denim and mm -hmm. uh bird's eye they called it for baby diapers they made a lot of that mm -hmm. now at that time in coolamie's history it was a pretty it bustling was, little it was, community it was the thing it was a, everybody either worked there or lived somewhere else mostly because there wasn't anything else around now in fact like, if, if history serves me correctly they had a movie theater in coolamie we did. They had a minor league baseball team right. in Coolamie. That's right. And, of course, they had the bull hole. That was always there. And because the bull hole is what supplied the power to the mill. Well, not exactly. It was the race. The water that came down from the race, it went off the side of the, the dam and all. The mm -hmm. bull hole was just what it is now. Now, right now, they will say the bull hole They'll show you a picture of the dam and call it the bull hole. It ain't the bull hole. Mm -hmm. The bull hole is in one area there where uh, below the dam, and uh, it's it's rather deep down in there And when the water's there, and that was the bull hole. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, now it's sort of, and it covers all the recreation area around there, but it's not really the bull hole. Yeah, and this is actually a very good... Uh, advertisement for people to go visit the park down at the bull hole yeah. yeah it's pretty nice down there so you got a letter in the mail drafting you or you joined tell me how you got into the military well i got a i'm not reaching for the letter now i'm just going uh i got a draft notice it said uh, like i was talking to mr leaser as he left he said it said my friends and neighbors but he said, I don't know what kind of favor they thought they was doing me. But anyway, that's what it said. Your friends and neighbors have chosen you. And I was in, uh, up until the, then, the draft age was 21. Mm -hmm. I was in the first teenage draft mm -hmm. uh, when they draft teenagers. And I believe I, I, I probably was 19 by then. When you got that letter, was there a sinking feeling in your heart, like, oh my goodness, or was it an exciting feeling that you were getting ready to see the world? It wasn't a sinking feeling, and it, uh, the way I remember it, it was, it was happening, and everybody was in on it, and I wanted to be a part of it, I guess, and so that was how I felt. I so, mean, so where did you go? You, you got the letter. You were I was drafted, and I went to um, Camp Croft to begin with. From Camp Croft, I went in to what state? In South Carolina. In South Carolina. And from there, I went to Fort Bragg, North Carolina, Bayfield. and took training. Uh, they were actually given infantry training at a field artillery facility. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, I had the infantry training there. After that, I was sent to Fort Dix, New Jersey, and assigned to the 90th General Hospital. And I stayed in the medics for two years. Mm -hmm. I went overseas with them, and we went to England in uh, in 40, January 44, and um, went across to France, Sometime after the invasion, it was a couple months after the invasion. Mm -hmm. But um, we set up over there in a hospital, and 
Well, anyway, from England, when we were in England, our hospital was receiving uh, casualties off of Normandy directly, like a um, field hospital. So you were the healing hand for a well, lot of those Well, at that time, that's what we did. I mean, and we got those uh, boys right off the right off the beach. They pick them. They still had the dirt off the beach when they got them back to England, and we were wounded and all that, of course. And they just patched them up and sent them back. Mm -hmm. But we were operating sort of that way then. It was, was this in not Salisbury? the way we would normally operate, not for a general hospital, mm -hmm. but in that case, we had to. But was it hard to see the shrapnel wounds? The the well, it was hard in the fact that I didn't know what to do for them. I mean, I was doing what I was supposed to do for them, but uh, I felt a little helpless because I'm sure, I mean, there was other doctors and things that were doing all they could do for them, and, and they were getting the, the best of care that was available. But I remember feeling sort of helpless when I look down trying to do my part of doing something for him and it just didn't seem like enough. They were in pretty bad shape. Yes, they were. Mm -hmm. Yes, they were. So how long were you in Europe? I was in Europe two years. Uh, we moved our hospital on up into France and uh, we were at a place called Barley Dew, France for a long time. And then after after Christmas of 44 in the Battle of the Bulge, I transferred out of the medical corps in because I'd had infantry training. I transferred into the infantry. And the 65th Infantry Division came over uh, around, I'm saying around Christmas, and then they moved on up and, and, and it was about several months later when they moved into Germany, I joined them then, mm -hmm. and, and we went moved, and we went to Germany. So at that point, you were actually I was a, I was a rifleman then. Mm -hmm. so I've asked this question, and uh, again, these are questions that uh, are tough questions. But uh, combat? Did you uh, participate in full combat? Yes, sir. Um, you had a rifle. Yes, sir. You had a gun. Yes, sir. War is killing. Yes, sir. Was was there, and did you see a lot of, and did you participate in that full combat? I did participate, and I was under enemy fire. Um, let me tell you what I think the worst thing, really, to me, about war. Now, this might not be what, I mean, a lot of, a lot of veterans can tell you. Now, I don't consider myself a hero by any long stretch of the imagination. I was there uh, doing my job. Uh, the United States and their allies were undertaking a pretty big undertaking. And I've always been kind of proud that I was able to be a part of it. and be. A, but I never felt, now some of the, they were some heroes. I guarantee you they were some heroes, and they ought to be called heroes. I never felt that I was. I never felt that my country owed me anything for what I'd done. I was just there and, and doing what was supposed to be, because that was a time then that we had a reason for it. There wasn't people pulling together and fighting each other we were all going together for a, for a cause, a cause that was good. And um, the thing that uh, I think mostly, when I think back of those times, those long ago years, is we, I seen an old French couple, oh, like I am today, <laughs> scratching on their hands and knees in a trash pile, just hunting for any little morsel of food that they could find. I've seen German children. When we would have a chance to uh, eat, they'd bring food up and, and uh, feed us, and we could eat. it didn't happen too often, but we could eat with our mess kits and all. 
and they would come and kind of stand around, and some of the guys would scold them and run them off, and they'd pick up their nerve and come back a little closer, you know. They wanted something to eat, that's all they wanted. And some of us would, uh, they, when, when they do that, they'd have these big pots of soapy, uh, big uh, barrels of soapy water here and one of clear water to wash our biscuits in. And we got where we leave part of our food and let some of the young ones eat it, and then they'd wash their things for them. But that's what I think about. I think about how cruel people had to suffer and suffer bad. And I think of the, we liberated a con uh, one of the concentration camps. We were the first ones there. And the people that come out of there, I, I guess I'll always remember and I think about them. I think about them a lot. They, they were lots of them, but they was two tall, real tall men. And I was 6'1". I was then. I, I think you're supposed to shrink when you get older. But anyway, <laughs> um, I'm 6'1", and they look taller than me. And they they walk side by side and, and, and along that fence outside that concentration camp they'd walk up way up there and walk back just like robots i don't know how long they'd been in a concentration camp but i could i looked at them they didn't have no feeling no nothing in their face no and their eyes were and just looking straight ahead and they might not have been as tall as I thought they was because they were awful skinny and they had the striped things that uh, concentration people in those camps wore. But I think about them and I wondered then, I just wondered then, will these people ever get back to anything close to being a normal way of life? And I think about them and wonder what happened to them. And that's the kind of thing I think about when I think about war. Yes, I've seen us under fire, and but that's that's it. That right there is what I think about the the cruelty of it. But is is the thing that I think about most. And I think when I hear people uh, trying to downplay the Holocaust and how uh, Jewish, I don't like to hear that mm -hmm. because. You've seen it. I've seen it. I've seen it, some of it. I've seen enough of it that I know it was real and I know it was <clears> a cruel <throat> thing. I, I Mostly, just what I expressed a while ago, I was thinking how cruel, how, how cruel people can be to people. I don't remember having any of the feeling that, well, we're doing a great thing, we're liberating y'all, you know, we're just doing it. Uh, I mostly just thought about how could this happen to people? When you were in combat, was there, uh, tell me about your spiritual side. How, how did, uh, do did, did you rely on your faith to get you through the hardship of war? I can remember thinking <laughs> like I uh, I'd make a deal with you Lord if you get me back here safe I'll, I'll do something for you and I'll serve you that, that's uh, I mean that, that's foolishness that is plain foolishness because um, I was not a Christian at the time that I was over there. And you can't, I mean, it's it's foolish to make a deal with the Lord and, and all that kind of stuff. Uh, I became a Christian later after, after the war. So to say and can and talk about it and say from a spiritual viewpoint I just wouldn't uh, I'd be way off base trying to do it mm -hmm. I, I really would because I didn't know the Lord 
when I was there. If you wanted to say something to somebody 20 years down the road, what would you tell them about World War II and the experience you went through and about our country? Well, I don't believe I could tell them any thing other than just say it was a time in history when our country was undertaking a, a, a big a big undertaking um, because the world had uh, seen Hitler and the Nazis and, and all just doing the things they were doing. And I, I don't know that I could say anything. I don't know if there'll ever be a time like that again because to me, it seems like when we have problems now, we're split and we're fussing at each other about how we ought to go about doing it. At that time, the world, and I'm sure there was some, not all, some difficulty with getting along and all that, I'm sure of that. But we were pulling together. The country was, our allies were, and all, it was a cause. We, we were focused on a cause and I believe that any time that we undertake anything worthwhile as a country as a people even as an individual we would stay focused on that and not be fighting amongst ourselves mm -hmm. It would be better, and uh, that uh, that that's the way it was then. And that's the way I saw it then. I want to thank you for giving yourself uh, in the 1940s. You gave a uh, blank check to the American government, and you said, "Cash it, even if it means my life." And I am appreciative for what you've done, and I honor you. And I appreciate you coming and sharing your story uh, with those people that are going to see this in the future. And I look forward to spending the day with you this Saturday in Washington, D.C. Thank you. I'm looking forward to it, too. Thank you, friend. Thank you, sir.